As a young black girl, it is enough to have to struggle with confidence about your hair and then to go on a set where you're supposed to be taken care of and nurtured and to have people there that are not as educated or qualified to do people of color's hair is disheartening. I was gonna have to tell you a story of how the very first hair person I ever dealt with said, ooh, I haven't put this rap on anyone since Sammy Davis Jr. I shouldn't have to tell you a story of a, being on a recent high budgeted production where since they couldn't have a barber on set, they drove me to some random sketchy neighborhood on my day off where the barber was a no-show. I shouldn't have to tell you that story. In fact, I don't have a single white counterpart in all of my 20 years of acting who has a similar story. What I think people don't realize is how often black women are trying to not come off as the difficult one. I would have to go to the barber shop at 4, 4.30 in the morning before set to get my hair cut. Uh, and then when I would get to set, I would see everyone else was in the hair and makeup trailer getting their hair cut. And when I asked why I couldn't get my hair cut at work, it was because this is what they told me, that they didn't have the budget for my hair. When he went to press my hair, he put a metal comb underneath the comb and um, that comb slipped out and the pressing comb basically burned my forehead and I had about five or six tooth marks on my face. It was quite frustrating um, for someone to say that they knew how to do it and to not really do it and to kind of use me um, as an experiment. After watching the hair and makeup artist do everybody else's hair on set, a mirror was thrust in my hand by her, and she asked me to do my own hair. In reference to my twists that I do myself, can you teach me how to do that? I've been told my hair is distracting, I've been told it's too wild, I've been told nobody knows how to do hair like this. I once voiced my concerns about my hair not being handled properly on a period piece that then required production to call on some outside resources. As a result, I was disrespected on a daily basis by the department head stylist who took offense to my truth instead of her acknowledging that she simply did not know how to manage my type of hair. So my hair cost production time and money and my peace of mind every day when I walked into that vanity trailer, all for something that could have been resolved in a simple consultation and finding the right person for the job. They hired a special effects artist to do my hair. Black hair is not special effects. I once had to find my own barber in a city I'd never been to before because no one on set had experience cutting my type of hair. I once discovered that my wig, which was the only wig worn by a black actor, was not so lovingly referred to as bonquisha by the head of hair because it was curly and mimicked black hair. I remember booking one of my first jobs and a Caucasian makeup artist did not know how to do my makeup. Thankfully so, I brought my own and I fixed it in my trailer. She knew I did it, and because of it, she refused to give me any touch-ups on set. Not one time did I receive a touch-up. I remember going to the PA and asking him how my makeup looked, and I remember him even taking a tissue and blotting my face because this woman refused to do anything. Somebody, um told me on a kinda hot day outside while filming. Um, they said, I've never seen edges shrivel up so fast. I once sat in a trailer where a hairstylist told me that they were surprised that my hair was nice and not nappy. And then they also told me that black women tend to not have tender heads and are able to take more pain. More than once on a production, I've had to do my own hair. Do you know why? Because out of everyone who was hired in the hair department, no one knew how to do hair that looked like mine. I went to my trailer and took a look at my hair and I was shocked. I sent a photo to my manager who was shocked. I sent a photo to our showrunner who was shocked. And I was the person who did my hair uh, uh, prepared my hair for the wig throughout the rest of the season. That meant me doing it on a daily basis. Someone once said to me when I was wearing my beautiful afro, well, 
can't you just figure out a way to make your hair smaller? Because I can't work with this. I was questioned by the head of the hair department on a project because I requested to have a black stylist on the team. Not only was there a lack of awareness for the importance of diversity on set, she attempted to diminish my valid concern by saying it shouldn't matter because hair is just hair. Someone once said to me, oh, I hope you got your hair cut the way you want it because I wouldn't know the first thing to do with that. I do think I have some black hair sheen spray if you want it shiny though. Um, I didn't have any kind of power or any kind of say and what was done to my hair that day and for many days after is that they took my beautiful, natural, healthy hair and straightened it every single day. I have not had the same curl pattern in my hair since that happened. If the hair person can cut a white person's hair and not a black person's hair, that is discriminatory. If the hair person can do a white woman's hair without them having to do any preparation yet, a black woman has to wake up earlier or they can't have their hair be natural, then that is discrimination. I shouldn't have to say Black Lives Matter or tape one of my lowest points or anyone's lowest points in order to prove to you that I am equal. I am equal and have always been equal. Hello, my name is Genevieve Penn and I'm a talent manager at Management 360. It should go without saying that as representatives, we have a responsibility to protect our clients and make sure their needs are being met to the best of our abilities. We negotiate fees, credits, trailers, travel, and back end. Meaningful consultation in regards to proficient hair and makeup for artists is just as important. Agents, managers, and lawyers, we are asking you to create an environment in which your clients feel safe and confident enough to express their needs in this space to you, their representative. Before your client signs on to a project, make sure casting, business affairs, and the producers are aware of what those needs are and ask how they will meet them. If something happens to a client during production, encourage them to report it to SAG. Our artists pay dues to a union that's supposed to protect them. Reps, you then also need to make a call to producers should an incident occur where production is not meeting its duty of care. This isn't cancel culture, it's accountability culture. And we're holding everyone accountable that made a commitment to change in the summer of 2020. And as reps, we're asking producers to build a coalition with us to help ensure equal standards are met for all. It's our duty to protect our clients and your duty to provide each member of your casts the same standard of care they each deserve. We're so excited for you all to be part of the conversation today. While we know we won't solve everything in the short amount of time, your presence and commitment to continue the work is noted. Thank you for being here, and please welcome our moderator, producer, author, and motivational speaker, Devon Franklin. Welcome. Uh, before I can even say a welcome, I'm upset. I watched that video and it's not right. It's not right that we are here in 2021 and we pride ourselves on saying we are an industry for a lighthouse for the world and people of color in 2021 are still being treated like we live and drive and work out of the back of the bus. I am completely, I'm sorry, I gotta just keep it real. I cannot believe that we are in this moment right now. And we, as a people and as an industry, we have to change. So before I can say a welcome, if you are not in this Zoom, if you are not in this panel for change, you can respectfully leave because we are tired. We are tired of giving all to this business and not being treated equally. And that video just made me emotional. It made me upset. And I'm grateful for SAG After Foundation I'm thankful to the PGA, I'm thankful to Gers Agency, I'm thankful to Management 360 for facilitating this conversation. It is long overdue. We are not riding the back of the bus any longer. We have to get equal representation and equal opportunity for our art and for our hair and for our makeup. So, excuse me for getting on my soapbox, but I'm sorry, I had to be honest about how I felt about what I just saw. So, as I catch myself, 
Welcome <laughs> to the Hair and Makeup Equity Panel, Changing the Industry Standard. And yes, while this is just a conversation, I am crazy enough to believe that this conversation can produce change in this business that is long overdue. So I wanna introduce our, our panelists. We do have some dynamic panelists today. Uh, we have Camille Friend with us, who is a veteran department head stylist on films such as Black Panther and Captain Marvel. We have Randy Sayer, who is a stylist and business representative for IOTC, which is the local 706. We also have Paul Garns, who is a renowned line producer, and he is also the VP of physical production for Array. And we also have Julie Plett, uh, one of the top showrunners and writers and producers in our business with hit shows like Vampire Diaries, The Originals, and the upcoming series on Netflix, Girls on the Bus. So Camille, I want to start with you. We've worked together before years ago on The Karate Kid. You have successfully navigated uh, these very difficult waters uh, as a hairstylist and now a department head on multiple hit films and been a department head for years. Can you just speak to the realities of what it is that um, you know people of color are dealing with? One, as it relates to hairstylists trying to make it up the, the ranks and, and becoming a department head. And two, your experience with people of color as talent and their challenges with finding uh, the right opportunities as it relates to getting their hair and makeup done. Um, hold on, Camille, you're muted. You did. There we oh, go. There you go. <laughs> there we go. So I just want to thank everybody for having me here and, you know, everybody here being open and honest. And I'm going to be honest about my experiences. So I just want to first start off and say that I've been really blessed in this business to work with excellent talent, excellent producers, and work with a lot of great directors. But I have to say, a lot of people don't have the same story that I have. And that's what I'm here to represent. Also, something I want to talk about, I am the hair and makeup executive from Warner Brothers for Canada. Last year, I was mm -hmm. hired for Warner Brothers because they know there has to be a change and they needed help. So these conversations with actors, we had these conversations with actors. I sat and cried on Zoom with actors for hours mm -hmm. because of the pain and the grief and everything that they went through. And even when I think about it, it makes me feel emotional. So these are things that are common. So a lot of times when actresses or actors get to me, they almost fall into my arms. And why do I, I get hired for big movies is because I can do anybody who sits in my chair. There's not a texture, there's not a shape. I know how to do it all. So it's not an excuse that the hair is a different texture. I can do any texture of hair. I know how to put on a wig properly. I know how to build a wig properly. So mm -hmm. it goes into the level of also education that has to be out right. there about doing the job and doing it in excellence. Mm -hmm. But as I have traveled around the world, I have met hairstylists from Canada, from New York, from LA, to London, to Paris, all black and brown hairstylists and makeup artists who constantly in this business who have been hurt who, not, who haven't been able to achieve their dreams in this business because of the racism and difficulty going up the rank because people don't allow them to get equity in this business, being department heads and being Keats. It's not okay just to call somebody to do somebody for the day. That does not build your resume. This was also brought to light this, uh, this, this year during all these diversity calls. So many black and brown hairstylists were upset because all they get called for is do one actor. So that mm. does not build any equity. It doesn't build your resume and it doesn't help you build your paycheck. So these are all things internally that are problems in our business that have to be solved. Mm. And, and Camille, real quick on that, on that solving, what do you think is the biggest obstacle to solving this problem? Because clearly this problem is, has been, you know, around for such a long time right. and it still is incredibly pervasive. What is the obstacle to solving it from your vantage point? I think, I think it's a couple of things. I think it's a lot of times, I think a lot of people don't know exactly that, you know, brown and black people that you can get into this business and work. I think it's, some of that is the lack of knowledge. And I think that, you know, the union requirements, people have to know what the unit requirements is in a real way and teaching people how to understand it and what's the real path to get into the union, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. And then I think, you know, it's just also the union being open to letting more people in and allowing this process to work. It shouldn't be an elite situation. 
You shouldn't mm -hmm. get in because you're somebody's kid or you're, you're, this person has done this. I'm a third generation hairstylist. Wow. So hairstyling is in my blood. I love what I do. I love filmmaking. I, you mean, I love everything about it. So it has to be something that people also know about and something that, you know, they have a passion for it and that they're trying to do it in the level of excellence in order if you want to be able to do $100 million movies. Marvel doesn't give you a $100,000 budget if they don't think you can handle it. And I've done right. seven, I've done seven um, Marvel movies. So that's proof is in the pudding. That's right. That's right. That's right. Because also what you're saying is, you know, equal opportunity, yes. then the playing field gets level. Right, and exactly. then and you can move up the ranks and to get the right, uh, you know, consideration. And then, you exactly. know, it's like, hey, you're able to do anyone's hair, got it. Exactly, and the resume has to be there. You know, the resume and the credits have to be there. So that's why, like, and I'll tell you, Devon, I teach, I have a company called Hair Scholars. And part of yeah, what I, I do is build people's resume and give them equity. So as you're building your resume and you're putting people in different jobs, and that's how you're building their resume so they can get into different positions and move up the ranks into places that it matters where they're yeah. getting movies that are getting nominated for an Oscar or, you know, are getting for Emmys. People who can, they can be celebrated in this business. Right on, right on. Thank you, Camille. Paul, I want to um, jump to you for a minute. You're one of the top line producers in the business. You're now uh, VP of Fiscal Production for Array. You know, give us your experience with, you know, this issue as you have, you know, been have overseen a number of films and a number of budgets and had to deal with studios and had to deal with talent. What's been your perspective with this issue? Sure. Thank you. I um, was truly touched by that video also. Um, really struck that that could still be happening on so many productions. Um, since we're on a PGA panel, I think that, you know, clearly a, a bigger conversation has to be happening on the physical production side, um, because we make those decisions on how the talent is taken care of. We make the decisions on who do we want to push for being a department head. Um, and those decisions have consequences. Um, and, you know, I think that video really laid out what those consequences are, you know, where you have talent that's feeling alienated or put upon and you know to be frank it that affects their ability to perform on set you know they carry that with them the whole day um and even though we're talking a lot about the technical proficiency um like camille said you know she can do everything right and a lot of people could learn to do more um but i think there's something also about the culture of the hair and makeup trailer which we don't give enough credit to that the actors spend so much time in hair and makeup before they come to set um, that you have to build, you know, an environment where people feel included. And sure. that inclusion just isn't the talent and the abilities that you have. That's to feel like you belong there. Um, and the best way to feel like you belong somewhere is not to be the only <laughs> one. Um, and so I feel like there's a, a, um, um, a larger conversation that we have to talk about where not only do we need more people to actually do hair and makeup, but we need more people in the business in general to fill these slots and to be department heads and to help make decisions. And, you know, you talk about a period piece or a specialty piece of hair, not having someone in the department that intimately knows what that's supposed to look like, what that's supposed to feel like. That can affect how the actor feels comfortably on set. Um, Absolutely. So these things have a lot of of meaning. So, you know, one of the, the things that over the years, um, um, Ava DuVernay and I produced a lot of shows together and we've always pushed for as inclusive of a crew as we could have. Um, and hair and makeup clearly is a big important piece of it. Um, and I think that, you know, the conversation that has started um, across the whole industry is super important um, for us to um, advocate for, you know, even if you have a department head that, um, you know, is someone who is not of color and they have a cast member that they know is coming on the show, be responsible enough to say, hey, I need to make sure my team has someone to represent that voice in how we do that. And that's why it's so important to have that representation. You know, in, in having that representation, um, you know, have you, you know, when you were on, as you were putting together crews and you know, have you experienced, you know, challenges? Have studios been resistant or what's been that conversation? And have you had to deal with the unions and what do the unions say 
if there are some issues or some people you're trying to get hired that you know may not be in the union, how do you navigate those waters? You know, and early in the uh, early in the business, there was this one kind of exception where you could get that one star's request. That was the the uh -huh. thing that you had to push for back in the day to do it. Um, I think the challenge was the unions just had to catch up with the problem, um, and the rules were put in place not to encourage. Um, you know, inclusion and diversity, they were put in place to, you know, make sure that there was security for employment. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that nowadays there's a belief that those two things are not mutually exclusive. Um, right. Is that you have diversity and still secure employment for the, the wider working base. Um, so early, early on, it was always a, a, a problem. I mean, you know, specifically, you know, when you talk about like barbers, barbers has been a, a hotbed issue um, until recently. Um, you know, now it's very common to have a barber um, on your show, but prior it was a big deal. I, I understood all those people who said, yeah, I had to go to some shop. They had to drive me somewhere to get my hair cut because no one knew how to cut my hair. Um, and I still, even to this day, believe it or not, know actors who say, yeah, I've never had, you know, a black barber on my show. I've always had to get, you know, no offense to the statement, but like the super cuts treatment to my hair, which... Mm -hmm. uh, they always felt like, you know, I don't look right. I don't feel right on, on screen because I, I know my edge isn't right or I know the fade isn't right. Um, and so those things um, have been a persistent problem, though. I think that, you know, th this conversation has kind of predated this, this forum in the sense that I think sure. those things are changing. Well, uh, I want to come back to what Array is doing uh, relative to the new database. We'll come back to that before uh, before we close. Uh, so, Julie, I want to I want to throw it to you. Uh, you know, you uh, you know are an incredible writer, incredible showrunner. Have you know written, created, uh, produced a number of hit shows that have had, that have featured uh, a lot of BIPOC talent. Would you just give us your you know, your experience? You know, dealing with these issues. Uh, in terms of, you know, making sure that your talent, you know, has the right hair and makeup and the challenges you may have run into along the way? Well, I would say, first of all, I'm grateful to be here and appreciate you all having me in this conversation because, you know, certainly years ago, I was as much a part of the problem as anybody else and can speak to that experience as being part of the problem um, <clears throat> in the context of a, you know, a showrunner's job is a million things and many of which are putting out the million fires that happen on any given day. And so a lot of things that, a lot of things that have fallen through the cracks over the years um, are things exactly like this, where you mm. are just not sensitive enough, you are just not anti-racist enough, you are just not thinking clearly enough. And so for example, I was working on a show that I was running and a black actor, um, the, the issue came up that he needed a barber and the, uh, the line producer went to the studio and said, we need a barber for our actor. And we had a black department head, black key, multiple black stylists, none of them were barbers. And so of course I, being white and hadn't, having not paid enough attention, didn't really understand mm. the distinction. Um, but the distinction was explained to me and I said, well, get him what he needs. <laughs> and it went up the mm. ladder and the studio's response was, we don't do personal hairstylists. Like we have a precedent if an actor, an actor can't have their own hairstylist on this or any of our shows, because once we open that Pandora's box, then, you know, then mm. everyone wants their personal hairstylist. And like, again, looking at it, looking at it in their minds from an, a, a, a non-racist, which is ultimately not anti-racist perspective, sure. right? Mm -hmm. So for them, it was money and it's always money, you know? And it was saying, if he needs, if his needs cannot be met with the people we have hired, then we, we can reimburse him for what he needs. And mm -hmm. so we heard that and we're like, well, that seems inconvenient and sort of annoying. Mm -hmm. um, Again, not outraged, just troubled. Um, well, that's, can we get the barber to come to set so that even mm -hmm. if we're reimbursing the actor for the work the barber, he's going to pay the barber for, but can mm -hmm. we not put him out so he doesn't have to drive somewhere else? No, we can't do that because the barber's non-union and we can't have non-union workers on our mm -hmm. set. So any way you looked at it, it didn't, it didn't really get you where you needed to go. And at a certain point, back then, wouldn't do that today, but back then the actors said, you know, 
okay, I'll just do it that way. And the rest of us said, okay, great. All right, moving on to the next problem, the next 900 problems. And so I think that has a lot to do. I mean, yes, racism has a lot to do with it. Let's be clear. I'm not negating all of the discrimination and all those practices. But if you want to give, if you want to look at it from um, uh, another perspective as well, there is a lot of just not understanding that you're not being a good advocate for your talent. You're asking them to take care of themselves, to advocate for themselves, to fight for themselves, to freaking mm. go get their hair cut themselves and pay for it themselves and then put in a chit themselves. And that's just not what we're supposed to do as, as, as bosses, right? And um, so my flaw in that, in that situation, I always believed looking back on it later was just that I gave up. I fought, mm. I fought the good fight. I made the phone calls, I went up the ladder and then at a certain point the ladder got too busy and I gave up and, uh, and let it go. And so I think that um, a lot of what a lot of us, and by us, I mean certain people like me who are white and learning on a daily basis have been learning lately is the mistakes that we have made in not being proper advocates and proper champions. Mm -hmm. And I think also like Warner Brothers being a perfect example that started making these phone calls and, and, and making these changes have started to understand that their financial model was way too restrictive to solve these problems when these problems were presented mm -hmm. to say a mid-level production executive who's in charge of the dollars. Uh, and so those are the things that we really need to light the fire under. The whole financial model of, of vanities and crews needs to change in order to get the kind of representation that we need and the ways that we need it. Mm -hmm. You know, Julie, I wanna um, ask you a question. I, I love you. First of all, thank you for your transparency in, in admitting that at one point you were part of the problem. Uh, what began to wake you up? Because uh, the reality is that, you know, no matter with, how much uh, the industry is becoming more diverse, uh, it is still more white than it is non-diverse, than it is diverse. So as a result, ultimately what we are fighting for on some level is to change the hearts and minds of white people uh, in power to be advocates with us to get this problem solved once and for all. How did it shift for, for, for you where you went from like, oh, the ladder collapsed to now like saying, no, 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 I gotta, I gotta make sure that I'm advocating all the way and now being a part of, of the change that you wanna see? It's shifted, it's a, a collective shift. I mean, I would say at first it was, well, it's the studio's fault, right? The studio mm. did that. The studio wouldn't let us do that. And ultimately we fought as best we could and the studio said no. So it wasn't my fault, it was the studio's fault. And I think the collective shift for me since 2016, since you know, leading up to the election and after the election, I just sort of had my own wake up call. And then for a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, other white people, it was, you know, it was this last summer and, you know, always late to the party. Let's be, let's be, remember that. But um, I just started realizing, well, wait a second, like I can get all outraged on the behalf of someone else, but like, what did I do? Sure. To make that better. What did I do? Like, why did I give up that fight? Because that fight didn't matter enough to me in that moment compared to the 950 other fights I was in. And I just started prioritizing my fights differently and prioritizing my advocacy and saying, OK, well, like number one on my list is making sure that if I have a set with actors of color coming in for their first day, how can we make them feel like they are surrounded by comfort and people that look like them and a situation where people have been hired to make them as comfortable and that the whole crew works with that harmony as much as possible. And by the way, I mean, I don't, I still don't think I'm doing enough and I still don't think that I've done, I don't think anybody on any of my sets would be like, oh, she's the best advocate for the, for the people of color in the world. Like, I think they'd be like, oh, she's doing great, but you know, you got it. <laughs> you got a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that's the point is like talking about it, being humble about it, being willing to accept where someone like me has made mistakes in the past and understanding that I actually have the power and the platform to make big changes and big demands and then having the confidence to step into that power, which you know, a lot of artists, we're, we all, we're all artists here, we're, you know, insecurity and lack of confidence is like one of our defining characteristics, but mm -hmm. recognizing my privilege in this situation that even if I'm insecure as a storyteller, I still need to be confident as a 
white privileged person in power that I can actually make good mm -hmm. change. So it's, uh, it's just reminding myself on a daily basis to do that work. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm hoping and praying that, first of all, thank you for agreeing to participate. And I'm hoping that this panel is a, is a stark reminder because, you know, if you as a showrunner step up and say, hey, even before we start this, hey, here's how this has to go. It's gonna, it's gonna resonate. You know, I know you and Greg have projects. If you and Greg say, wait, hold on guys. No, 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 uh-uh. As a condition of getting this show, this is what has to happen, period. It's gonna happen because you all's voice matter and people wanna be in business with you. I so I want to um, go to you, Randy. You are the lone union rep on this panel. Uh, I don't know if to pray for you or to say thank you, but I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Here's the question, Randy. Help us understand what is going on at the union level. You've seen the video. You're hearing the testimonies. The chat is going crazy. I had a conversation last night with a very prominent Black male actor uh, who is in Toronto has even on that show, has he'll still had to go to the hood to get a barber. He's written letters to the union. To this moment, there's nothing that has changed. Randy, you're here. We are appreciative of, your, of you being here. Help us understand this problem from a union level. Good evening, Devon. Uh, my name is Randy Sayer. I am the business representative of the Makeup Artists and Hairstylists Guild, a job that I have had for about two and a half years. And prior to that, I was the assistant to the business representative for the prior 12. And I heard your admonition at the beginning of this panel discussion that if any of the five panelists wanted to not be a part of the solution, they were invited to log off. So I'm, I'm a white man in my 60s and I am here having the very difficult, uncomfortable conversation because I feel strongly this is a situation that is turning around and that we can continue to drive forward. Now, I will first speak to what you just spoke to about a man calling the union or, or addressing the union. I am the business representative. I have two assistants. One assistant deals with a roster, which is the film and television side of the industry. And I have one assistant that deals with non-roster, which is the theater and live performance side of the industry. That's it. That is our entire office. We are not like other unions where we have to call a different floor and see who's available to talk to somebody. I'm the guy. Mm -hmm. My other uh, roster business representative, her name is Polly. Any calls such as the call you're saying from your actor comes to me and I will have that conversation. I do not recall any such conversation because I love talking to talent to actors and actresses and explaining to them how they can get their hair and makeup needs met. From the union perspective, we are not the employer. And I hear, heard what Julie said about the studios, but it is the studio that employs department heads. They hire the department heads and the department heads end up hiring the, the departments with the studio's blessing. Hire the right person for the job. If you are going to have a period show that's all set in the 1800s, you need to hire the hairstylist and the makeup artist department heads who can handle that period show. I do not personally feel that a hairstylist should have special education in dealing with textured hair. I do not believe that a makeup artist needs to have a special education to deal with a different skin tone. Skin is all about the undertones and we should all as hairstylists, and I've had the pleasure of working with Camille Friend uh, and, and makeup artists, all must know our trade. We come into the union knowing what we knew to get our initial 30 days of work. And for many of our members, they talk about it took years to accumulate the days. It took a much longer than they thought. Once you get in the union with whatever ever skills that got you there, you had a celebrity that wanted you, or you were an excellent barber, or you were a makeup artist that knew prosthetics, whatever your skill was that you came in, we have to teach you everything else. Everything you didn't know upon coming in, we need to teach everything else. 
we do a lot of education. There's a lot of outside education, like my sister Camille Friend talks about. But every artist needs to be better. I don't know a single singer that doesn't take class. I don't know a dancer who doesn't take class. I don't know an actor who doesn't take class to protect, to, uh, to perfect their craft. And we have to instill that very same uh, hope for excellence in our own members. Okay, but but and Randy, you need to cut me off because I'm just going to just keep talking. <laughs> thank you, thank you for that cue. So next time when I do, everybody knows I'm not being rude. Um, but Randy, let's let's just let me let me poke at that a little bit, please, mm -hmm. because you're saying, oh yeah, once you get into the union, you should be able to. But we are hearing that that's actually not what's happening, because predominantly, you know, the system, you know, from my vantage point as a producer and as a former studio executive, uh, the system is really set up, uh, you know, in a way that is very hard for people of color to get in the system to begin with. Mm -hmm. So and then also the, the white people that are already in the system, the demands for them to learn how to do you know, our hair and our makeup, that demand is not made very strongly. There are number, numerous, you could take every testimony in that video and there is a claim from a production where there was a, a head, head of department that did not do their job. So from a union standpoint, one, is there anything being done to look at the requirements to get into the union that can help you know, uh, uh, stabilize and equalize the playing field? Is there anything being done there? And then two, what is the advocacy that you all are actually doing to be a major change in this issue? Let's explain first. The employer, the, the studios have had a stranglehold on employment since the beginning of time. They first owned the studios. And when the studios were broken up in the 60s, they created an entity uh, it's called contract services and the contract services entity is created to facilitate what's called the roster system. Roster is a big giant list of names and the producers own the roster and everyone talking about how hard it is to get into the union, how hard it is to get their days, how hard it is to get studio work is really talking about the roster system, getting the days to get onto the producer's roster because once you're on the roster, you're automatically invited to join the union. I can give everybody who's watching this, I know we have four digits of people watching, I can give everyone a union card, but that doesn't get them on the roster. That doesn't allow them to do film and television. So within our union, and this is something probably newer, uh, Paul talked about the star waiver request, which has been around for about three decades when Mr. or Ms. Celebrity wants to have their personal makeup artist and or personal hairstylist on a show, there's a mechanism for that. There's also a special skills waiver. Remember, these are the producer's rules. The producers built the rules and built the roster, but they also gave themselves two outs to get around their own rules. One is the star waiver, one is the skills waiver. Um, Polly, who I work with, she's my right arm. Uh, Polly talks about the star waiver is what we have to fill for producers because it's contractual and uh, producers want them to keep the star happy. Not everybody has the juice to request a star. So the skills waiver is something that we get to work with. When a production does not have somebody within their ranks to come in and do the work, we provide them with resumes. We let them but choose. We, we, who, we don't who, get to choose who, the person. Who does right. that though? Who, Randy, who, who, puts, who makes the request for the skills waiver? The production. So the, the production. Mm -hmm. So, so in that in that regard, it's it, it would be on the actor of color, whether they're Asian, Indigenous, Black, mm -hmm. Native American, whatever the the uh, ethnicity of that particular actor is. You're saying that they would have to be the ones to then flag it to their head of department, and the head of department has to then come to you for a skills well, labor or a skills labor. How does that work? Ideally, it's the department head who knows that he or she is deficient in whatever skill, braiding, barbering. Uh, natural hair texture. Women don't want to have heat and product applied to their hair like, like the old days or working with highly textured hair. Uh, wigs, lace front wigs. These are all skills, mainly hair, uh, that we have requests from. Ideally, the department head says, I need two braiders and I need a barber and I'm going to need them on Friday. I say, have your trusted producer call us. Let's get a skills waiver. These waivers do not cost any money. There's no, there's no dollar amount to them. 
I literally send them the template, they fill out the template and they send it back to me with the contact information. And those people can be working on the show the following day. Okay, wait, hold on one second, Randy. So, so Camille and, and Paul, I mean, either of you that want to jump in here. Have you used this skills waiver? Is it as easy as Randy makes it seem? Uh, Camille, please jump in. So I'll tell you on Tenet, I needed some barbers because we had we had large military numbers and there wasn't the, let me say the, the roster was exhausted. Of, uh, there was no barbers on the roster to use. So I did request for six barbers to come and work on our show. Six barbers came and they did come and work. And I worked closely with Polly and Randy to get that done. And, and Warner Brothers helped sign off on it. And those, all those six um, young men are in, are in the union now. Got it. So it took you as the head of department to go and do the advocacy and then work with the union and the studio in order to make that done, get that done. Yes, definitely. That's, that's what it takes. Now I got, I got another question. Does, I'm gonna come right to you in one second, Randy. Camille, does that come from you as the head of department identifying that you have a need or does that come from you as a black woman seeing that there is a, a, an overall challenge that you want to fix? Help me understand where that comes from. I think it's, it's, it's both sides because I'm a department head over here and I'm a black woman over here. So I think what yeah. it is as a department head, you have to know what you need. Like for me, I don't necessarily hire your friends. I hire people who can do the job. I don't care if you're white, black, red, or purple. I hire people who can do any type of hair texture that sits in the chair. So it's our job as department heads and even producers, if you're going to hire a department head, hire the person who can do the job. Don't hire people who are just their friends or because of nepotism or this, that, and the other. Hire the person that's in the job because at the end, who's suffering is, is our actors. And as far as the barber side goes, I've been hiring barbers for 10 years. You can ask most of the barbers who are in local 706 have worked for Camille Front because I hired the barbers because it's something now for over 10 years I've been hiring them because it's something that is required when you have a black male in your cast and you need for them to feel like they're supported. They need to feel good every day when they go to work. So that's something that I always do. Like I'm getting ready to do Black Panther 2, you know, Wakanda forever. I've already hired three barbers because mm -hmm. I know what it requires, I know what it takes. And I know I yes. want all the guys who come in that trailer to walk out and feel great. Okay, well, thank you, thank you. So, so I wanna hit you, Paul, I'm gonna come to you, Paul. Paul, because then Randy, I'm gonna come back to you and Julie, I definitely want you to chime in here. So is the, is the waiver, you know, the skills, give me the proper name, Randy. I don't wanna butcher the name of, of the waiver. There is a star request waiver. Yep. And there is a special skills request waiver. Okay, great. So, so Paul, is the special skills request labor the, the solve to this problem, or is it a band-aid on a, and, and that there's a larger problem that needs to be looked at? Um, first off, I don't think the waivers were put in place necessarily to deal with this problem. Um, it was just the, the, the past of least resistance. Mm -hmm. um, it was the way to deal with it as it became a problem. I don't think industry-wide we've really taken a look um, at the system to say maybe we should rethink this moving forward because the system was created so long ago uh, and it serviced one concept and now it's a very diverse field um, and a different concept. The other thing I would say is you know as you were asking Camille you know would you pursue that would you do it um, you know, she did it because she knew it was important and it was important to her. But for a lot of department heads, it's not important. Right. Um, the same way Julie said, when you push it up the line, all those people who were making the decision whether they should challenge that, they probably weren't black. And they probably didn't really have any understanding institutionally or personally of the importance of that decision that they were making. Um, and then equally, like she said, it, they were worried about setting a precedent um, the downside for us is that a lot of those precedents that have set using the waivers, um, you know, um, not allowing it to happen or letting people go off site to get their hair done, those set precedents. And then those became industry standards um, instead of addressing the core problem, which is representation. How do we effectively change the look? 
And, uh, you know, I, I've been watching the chat and I know um, that, you know, people are always hard on the union. Uh, look, I'm a line producer. I've been hard on the union, but it's not a union problem. It's an industry problem. Um, and that's a pervasive problem that stretches from the, you know, the low man in the totem pole all the way up to the people who run studios. So, so um, Paul, help us unpack that, right? Because it's, it's, I get what you're saying, pervasive. It's not just the unions. So... Who, who, where does it sit? Because the unions have certain requirements to get in the union. The studios have certain hiring practices. And at the end of the day, you know, BIPOC, you know, hair and, and makeup and artists are not able to actually get in the union to get the consideration. So who, where does the problem? I, 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 the way I'll say it is the way that, you know, anyone who's in the IA has taken a safety class. And the first thing that they teach you in safety is that safety, your own safety is your responsibility. Um, and honestly, I think we all have to take ownership to our parts in this process, every last one of us. Okay. Um, and if you see, it doesn't matter, you don't have to be a person of color to see injustice being done. You know what I mean? But clearly people sit back every day and allow this stuff to happen. Um, you know, other actors are letting it happen, producers are letting it happen, the studio's letting it happen. Nobody's just taking it on as their problem, except for that lone, let's say that one actor they have on the show. Um, you know, I've been very lucky to work with lots of uh, department heads of color in hair and makeup. It's always been important to the shows I've worked on, but, and, and because it's been important, we've never had that problem. You know what I mean? And that, there's nothing special. I'm not doing anything outside the ordinary to make sure it doesn't happen, but it's important to me. It's not something that I'm going to push off and say, well, it's just that one actor coming in that day. You know, it's, it's important. So we've got to address that from the get. And yes, I've been in lots of those conversations to get waivers done when the situation requires it. But again, that's just a tool that's not solving the problem. Got it. Got it. Speaking of which, I just want to uh, draw our attention to a comment from Moira Frazier. She said, uh, or she says, I have over 30 days under a special skills waiver. Took all my classes, but was told that in order for it to count, I had to work one show for 15 days for them to count. Um, Randy, can you can you extrapolate on that? Uh, is is there anything that can be done at the union level, specifically around this issue, to help produce a stronger solution other than just relying on the waiver? Sure, we can wait till contract negotiations roll around again, uh, which will be in 2024, and we can petition the uh, AMPTP for a full barber classification in our local, which is on my wish list, and it will be accomplished before they put me in an urn. But I can't really say to a department head, um, hey, I understand you need a barber tomorrow. You need them by Friday, you need them tested tomorrow. But you know what? We're gonna get that classification negotiated in in 2024, and that'll be a much better solution to the whole problem. This waiver thing, really a Band-Aid. And we don't want to be looking like we're putting a Band-Aid on something. The, the, the waiver situation, which has been in place, which is known by all of the productions, is a way of getting people on the productions with the skills that are needed. And these count towards days to get into the industry. And Paul, brother, I'm going to say to you, uh, on your productions, you're not seeing this as a problem. But on productions where we do not see BIPOC executive producers, producers, showrunners, line producers, UPMs, writers in the writer's room, it is a problem because I feel that when there's an executive producer on site or a line producer or a UPM that says, no, we're, we're don't care what the studio policy is, we're, we're, we're getting breakers in tomorrow because that's what's needed on the show. We're not sending them out and doing it. Think about it from the union perspective. Do I, you know what? I think the better solution is we send them to a supercut somewhere in the neighborhood and they can just turn in a bill. That's the better. No, what does the union want? The union wants licensed barbers, licensed cosmetologists, trained experienced uh, makeup artists doing the work on site on the show. And we want them under a union contract. We want them earning their days. So for my money, the waivers are working right now until we can get all of this worked out in Co uh, uh, collective bargaining negotiations. Julie, what's your perspective on this? Have you had to use the waiver? Um, and if not, what, how are you interpreting <clears throat> this conversation? You know, I, I didn't know about the waiver and uh, I'm glad to 
be educated. I did know about the roster and I knew it more specifically to, to other unions where if you're not on the roster, you may as well not exist. And that the roster itself, the getting on that roster comes with a lot of nepotistic uh, avenues that have we, people have been trying to combat for years as well. But that all being said, what, um, what Randy just said, which is so true and honestly where as we you know, move forward, I sign off on the hire, I, the showrunner, signs off on the hire of hair and makeup. The line producer gathers the names that they put in front of me. Um, the line producer gets those names from either agents or the roster itself um, or the studio production. And if the studio and the line producer and the showrunner or the UPM are not in agreement spiritually about the questions that need to be asked and the work that needs to be done before making a decision about who to hire to run that department mm -hmm. or who, if they know who they want to hire to run the department, who that, that person is going to then crew up their department with, if we're all not having these conversations pre-hiring, that's where we're making all the mistakes. I've never asked any of these questions before. I've never thought of any of these questions before because I'm behind. Um, <clears throat> I hire in all departments, crew members that I know and like and have worked with because on my shows, I like the crew to feel like family. But if you only are ever hiring, like Randy said, the people that you know and like and trust, then your world is getting smaller and smaller and no one's challenging each other and no one's like, no one's pushing anybody to reach out and make sure everybody on the team is properly skilled, has the right, um, has the right abilities, has kept up with their training and has the commitment to hiring the right team. So it really, it, it does, it's a, it's a full court press. It is the studio making sure their line producers and UPMs are with the program. It is the union making sure they're communicating properly between with the line producers and UPMs. It is the showrunners and writers who are asking the right questions from the creative perspective before any decisions are made. Um, and it's everybody just aligning with that commitment to do better and to make this better. And then we can really, once that's happening, we can also really start digging in into like, wait a second, what are the barriers to entry at the bottom? Because mm. that's really the big problem for this whole business is all the barriers to entry at the bottom, right? Because right. if you can't get in, you're never getting up. And, um, and those are things that, you know, probably a whole nother panel, but those are things that we need to all no. work on too. I, mean, I, I love that quote, if you can't get in, you can never get up. That's absolutely true. And Camille yeah. Cower, uh, who's, a, who's one of our attendees in the audience, she had a question. Are there any plans to help get more hair and makeup uh, artists in the union? Um, that's the red line that BIPOC artists can't get past. Who wants to take that question? Uh, it, how, how does it, is that true? First and foremost, is, is that true? That it's really hard for BIPOC artists to get into the union? And if that is the truth, what can be done about it? Randy, go ahead. I heard you. Go ahead. Say it again. Not true. Not true. Okay, so I understand that when I'm uh, approving waivers or when I'm talking to people on the phone, when uh, the paperwork comes in and it says Camille Friend, it says Terry Allen, it says uh, Brian Gosling, um, this does not tell me anything. I'm lucky if it ha gives me any hint to gender, but all of this is superfluous when we're talking about talented individuals. Uh, we're processing paperwork and approving people based on, did they get their 30 days? Did contract services approve them? We're approving them. Our approval process normally happens in the same day that contract services sends us the paperwork, especially if we've got all the paperwork backing up all of the work that they've done. So is, is it difficult for someone? I actually, I consider things that are, that are good in life. I call, call them goodies. Finding out that somebody who just came in is a woman of color, that's a goodie. Finding out that they are, they're trans, and I'm a little late on picking up sometimes, that's a goodie. Finding out that the, uh, the hairdresser or the, or the barber that we approved is a man, that's a goodie. It's always great to find out that you are making diversity. And you know what? Diversity is possibly, man, I say this all the time, possibly mankind's greatest asset. It's wonderful to find out that people with skills coming into the union are also bringing their diversity and their knowledge and all of their experience with them. These are all goodies for the union. Right. However, from what I can tell you from my own personal experience, uh, from my wife's experience, who's an actor and she's on a show, uh, she's on a movie right now, from all of the comments from BIPOC artists 
in the chat. Randy, respectfully, it does not seem like it's that easy to get into the union. And the way you're describing a goodie seems like, oh, after the fact, oh, we discovered it, but there was no intent around it. I just wonder what would happen if the union said, we want to be more intentional around this. And the studios were saying, we want to be more intentional around this. Could Because here's what I know, having traveled the country, I can tell you that there are, are, are thousands of qualified BIPOC artists of every race, every creed that are, could absolutely be successful in this business. And a lot of times, you know, when I would ask, you know, a stylist, hey, well, why aren't you, you know, on this movie or on the show? It's like, well, you know, getting into the union and the way, and also it requires almost for some artists to have a stipend because we don't come from the same economic background as, as others. So I understand that maybe from your vantage point that the administration of it is, is easy, but I, I, I would encourage if there's a possibility for there to be real intent around it. Um, speaking of which, so Laz Alonzo, who's my buddy, he's one of the top actors in the business. He is here in this Zoom and he put in the chat that he's still dealing with this issue. And he said, uh, IATSE needs to allow barbers in. Barbers should be allowed in as barbers, not cosmetologists. What is the thinking uh, and perspective on that? Randy. I, I am so sorry. I, I, can, can you repeat the question? I'm so sorry. Sure, IATSE needs to allow barbers in. Barbers should be allowed in as barbers, not cosmetologists. Understood, we don't have a barber classification. Like I said, our next contract negotiations with the AMPTP will be in 2024. Um, I had hoped to get it negotiated into this year's co contract negotiations. It's not going to be able to happen. So 2024. So right now what we do is we bring them in, we allow them to work, they join the union. We do not have a barber classification. If they have a valid cosmetology license, in addition to their barber license, they come in as a hairstylist. If they don't have a... Uh, a cosmetology license, but they are a licensed barber. They come in under makeup because makeup artists are allowed to barber, which is ancillary to their regular job. Is it a perfect um, fix? It is not, but that's what we have. Again, as I'm hearing, you know, the waivers are just a band aid, but it's getting people in and it's getting people working. It's getting people their days. It's getting people on the roster and it's getting people working on these productions where we desperately need them. Or we can just put a kibosh on the whole thing and wait till 2024. And that's not a solution. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think we all completely agree with that. Uh, and maybe, you know, we should all just for the moment, because knowing how these bargaining things can go, maybe we do, you know, I'm glad this panel is highlighting the waiver. And now this waiver is becoming, there's some more public publicity around it. Because maybe we can use that waiver to our advantage until uh, the collective bargaining agreement is, is renegotiated. Julie. I'm just curious what prevents it, what prevented it, what were the barriers to entry in this contract cycle that prevented it from being part of the conversation? How did it, how did it fail? Like who, <laughs> who blocked it? Producers have not shown a great deal of enthusiasm, shall we say, to add another classification to the contract. They seem to feel that makeup artists and hairstylists have been doing the job for, for, for you know, years and we don't need to add anything more. But I know in my, I'm in my 15th year, I know for the last decade that barbers have become a really hot button issue and we have found a workaround to make it happen until we can get the producers enthusiastic. Remember, producers are the employers. Mm -hmm. It's the institutional stuff, I guess, is what mm -hmm. we're talking about. Camille. Okay, I just want to address, and Randy, I understand that the union has really worked really hard and with the barbers now coming in on the makeup side, but I just have to speak to, I have to speak for the people. So the problem that I have with it is that when barbers come in on the makeup side, if they come in on the makeup side, they are not allowed to department head and they are not allowed to be keys. So that stops them having equity and have a seat at the table. And that's where I have an issue with it. And I think collectively, if we look more into mentorships and doing, and doing you know, internships, I think that's something that the unions, other unions, the producers, our union, Local 706, 798, 
all the unions could really work on is doing more mentorships and doing, doing things like that and do more training sessions. Because that's one thing for me, I run a mentorship my own self because guess what? I got sick and tired of being sick and tired. So I said, mm. I'm gonna do it myself. So I run a mentorship. So, so I can help people and pull them up. Like Julie said, take people by the hand and pulling them up so they can be in this business. And the other mm. thing I'm gonna say, I think a lot of times with the hair and makeup, I, I, I've said this for years, some people disagree, but I'm gonna say it publicly. I think it's also, it's an actor thing. And I think it's a SAG issue. I think if SAG mandated certain things for their actors, that you would get better results from other unions. And that's just my opinion. Mm. Um, uh, <laughs> Paul, jump in and then I wanna come back to you, Camille. Uh, Paul, go ahead. I, I still feel like a lot of our conversations focus around the technicality of it. Um, and ultimately, the waivers have been there for a long time. You know, not everyone knew about it, but people have been using them for a long time. And the problem is still persistent. Mm -hmm. I think it's a technicality problem. I think it is a bigger problem. Uh, you know, and, and when I said it before, it's because it's not important to enough of us. It's important to the ones that it affects, but to everyone else, to Julie's point, wasn't even on her radar as something she should be concerned about. Um, and I don't, and, and, and when the question was asked to Randy, like, why didn't it, it change? Because it wasn't important. If it was important, it would have changed, but it's not important. And we need to make it important uh, yeah. because it is an important thing, but, but it's been so trivialized and it's been so pigeonholed to say, well, it's a technical thing. And if we can get more people qualified, then more people will get hired. That's not necessarily true um, because there are people in the business who don't work. Um, who only can work if it's hiring them for black people. You know, you, you'll get a person of color who does hair and they won't hire them on a show where there's no black people on it um, mm -hmm. because it's still mm -hmm. the same problem. Mm -hmm. I still think it's a, a wider problem than just technically making it accessible. I think that we have to look deeper into why it's been this way for so long and how do we really make a change? <clears throat> it isn't just open the floodgates and let people in because you still got to get hired and people still have to think it's important for it to change. Mm -hmm. um, Paul, I love what you're saying. And Julie, I'm going to come to you because actually something you said earlier is really, um, you know, what we are all trying to change. Julie, you mentioned uh, the concept of family. And, and this business is run in many ways with that family mentality that who you know, that's who you want to hang with. That's who you want to socialize with. And as a result, you know, if, if, if a BIPOC artist or executive or producer or talent is not considered or viewed as family, for generations, we get kept out. So it's about expanding to Paul, what you're saying is like, yeah, people can be in the union, but if the family definition is not broadened and new people can't get into the family, then you can be in the union and still be unemployed. Julie, go ahead. Yeah, one quick thing on that, if you don't mind, just because th that has really been the greatest, one of the greatest lessons I've had to learn. And it, it sort of began when um, you looked at your directing roster and it was uh, out of 22 episodes, 17 white men and five of everybody else and white men who had been directing every episode of television for you for years and years and years. And you just stopped hiring them for a while, you know, because you just you just didn't want to anymore because I wanted, I personally wanted to create opportunity for other people, but those are people whose dinner tables I'd been at Thanksgiving at, you know, and whose kids I had seen grow up from, you know, from birth to like junior high. And so there's stretching outside of what you understand your family to mean is work. It is part of the work, right? You have to say to someone that you know and care about and know their children that you're not going to give them a job you know, and that is work. And that is why it, it is important to understand that there is that work to be done. And I wanted to just circle back to the very beginning because Paul's right, we, we did, you know, we are talking a lot about the technical stuff, which is super important. But I think again, for, for showrunners, for storytellers, for managers and leaders on the creative side, um, to go back and look at that, you know, that testimonial and just understand that as a result of our either ignorance, unawareness, naivete, uh, carelessness, or just flakiness um, as a result of us not having been paying attention. Look at the harm that we actually caused 
and or a part of causing and think of now what we can do to start making amends and reparations for that harm. And I think that that is, if any lesson can be taught on just like a, again, a sort of almost a spiritual level to other storytellers and other managers, it's like, you know, take accountability for the part we played in this and let's get to work at making at making that right change. And, and we gotta be, the Writers Guild should be joining this, this conversation and training its future showrunners and its future leaders in this conversation. Mm -hmm. SAG, I agree, all of it, like DGA, we should all be, we should all be part of this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of part of the conversation, you know, clearly this is a conversation that we can have multiple installments in the series, given that they're the breadth and depth um, and also the passion of this conversation. Uh, I know, you know, our time is, is already running short, um, but I want to make sure that Camille, you get a chance to tell us about the hair scholars and beyond the cones. And then Paul, I want you to give us much more insight into uh, this incredible new tool that Array has created um, that is changing the industry. So Camille, why don't you give us some insight on hair scholars and beyond the cone? Okay, I, so I it, I don't know anything about Beyond the Cone. I do know that it's Rhonda O'Neill's company. So I'm just hair scholar. Oh, okay. So cool. I just want to say for me, I've been all everywhere and I've always taught. So I decided to start a company because I knew I wanted to be the change in this business. I, didn't, I wanted to stop talking about it. I wanted to be about action. So I did something about it. So what my company is, it's Hair Scholars, it's my baby, and it's my passion. Like, I'm so passionate about teaching and about mentoring people and mentoring them about how to get into the business, how to be department heads, how to be keys, lace front wigs, everything that you need to know in this business, that's what I'm teaching. And I'm teaching from my perspective, yes, but I'm the girl, I do $100 million movies. I've done seven Marvel movies. The proof is in the pudding. I, you know, I'm in the academy. There's things there that I have great accolades and I'm willing and I've opened my heart in teaching and I need, and I have truly, I'm passionate about it. And I want people mm. to be able to come in this business and really, really learn how to be department heads, how to be keys for they can grow and they can prosper and truly have a seat at the table and have great equity. So that's what I have. And it's hair scholars and hairscholars.com. Thank you. Oh, wow. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Paul. Um, so yeah, Array Crew is a database um, for below the line crew of women and people of color. Um, and uh, that is something that was started, literally just launched this year. Every major studio and streamer um, has partnered with us on it. And the goal is to address the problem that happened after many actors said, you know, they wanted inclusion writers to make sure that they had crews of color behind them um, on the camera. And then a lot of the response from the studios and producers, which is true, they were like, well, I don't know any to Julie, what Julie said earlier. So how do I find them? I can't find them. Um, and so this is a database which allows you to go in and search for every position below the line. Um, and it's a great tool for producers to find department heads, but it's also a great tool for department heads to find crew. So if you have a hair and makeup person and you're looking for a qualified person of color, a woman, um, someone um, who you wouldn't normally be able to go out and find, this database allows you to search, have a valid way to know that they are professionals, that they have real verified credits, um, and a way to reach them. And it is allowing uh, more and more productions to be able to reach out and fulfill what everybody says they want, you know, inclusion and diversity. Mm. Um, there was a question here from Jason George. Can Array's database allow for pictures of hairstylists and barbers for? Um, port like portfolios? Is that portfolios the or if somebody is, you know, looking at them and they see their credit, it's not just a credit, but like, oh, here's a sampling of the work they've done. Is that is that yeah. something that's even been considered or done? Or yeah, yeah, it has it has that capability existing. My already. picture's up. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, not just your picture, but like literally yeah. pictures yeah, of. You, put a link, you absolutely can put a link in their pro yeah. to your portfolio. Absolutely. Got it. And just to make sure, I just put a the link a link two links in the chat. ArrayCrew.com, right? Yep. And then uh, HairScholars.com, Camille. Yes. Okay, fantastic, just making sure. Um, I know that the hour is late. I just wanna give each of you just a moment to say anything that's on your heart before we close. And Paul, since we're talking to you, why don't we start with you? 
Sure. I, look, I think this is such an important conversation, and I'm glad that we have so many different areas um, of the industry in this conversation. Um, it will be an ongoing thing that we have to tackle and we have to make important. Um, I think that um, not only do we need to make it technically accessible to people, we need to make it really accessible to people and common for you to have people of color on your set when it's unrelated to even talent of color. Um, and hopefully that's something that, you know, we can, you know, keep working forward to over the next couple of years. Thank you. Randy. Thank you, Devon. Um, I agree. This is an absolutely vital, important conversation that needs to be had now and needs to continue. This is not something that's going to be solved. Um, racism, sexism, homophobia, anti-Semitism, the, these are, these are, um, these are jobs that don't go away. And I, I hope to be able to have better conversations with you all in the next year, in the next two years, in the next three years. Um, but I think it's really important. Speaking to your uh, question earlier, Devon, about um, pictures, we, Local 706 this past year, develop a Local 706 phone book app so our members can have everyone's contact information on their phone. This is a first. I like to say that we finally came into the 21st century and um, we do allow pictures of our members to be put on the app. So there is no excuse as to who you're hiring. Got it. Thank you, Randy. Uh, Julie. I am just extremely happy I got to sit in on this conversation and I, I am very grateful for what I learned and in the comments, especially where I see a, a root of a lot of comments coming from. So thank everybody for in the panel for their wisdom and in the chat for their feedback. Right on. Camille. I just want to say to all my hair, makeup, and barbers, don't give up. It might be hard to get in the union, but don't give up. You will get there. Just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep going. And if it's in your heart, and you know that you're a filmmaker, don't give up. You can't give up. We have to continue fighting. We have to continue pushing, continue working on your skills and being the best person that you can be. And I wanna to say to the producers, just as we go to the bargaining table, please be open to allowing the barbers in. It's something that is needed and, and be open to the change. People said that you know gay marriage would never happen in the US, it did. They said that we would never have a black president. It's happened. Change can happen and you can be a part of the change. So be active and be a part of the change that can happen within our unions. Thank you guys. Mm. Thank you. Listen, Camille Fran for president 2024. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. Yes. <laughs> wow, we, I just want to thank, we want to thank the PGA, uh, the SAG After Foundation, Gersh, Gersh Agency and Management 360 for sponsoring this panel. Uh, the, the, the fire has been lit. The movement has begun. Yep. We knew that this panel was not going to solve the problem, but I believe it is a powerful catalyst to the solution for the problem. Uh, there have been over 100 questions submitted, uh, hundreds more comments. This is an issue that, that we all have to take on. Paul, I take what you're saying, that we all have to approach it from different areas and band together and make this change. I want to thank all of you. Uh, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that, that RSVP. Uh, this is probably the biggest Zoom that I've ever been in uh, because everyone knows that this issue is so important. So if you are listening and you are in a position of power and change, no matter what vantage point you are seeing this from, I pray that this conversation has stirred something in you where you are going to say from this day forward, similar to Julie, what you said, hey, I, my eyes are open and now I can never unsee what I have now seen, that this is a problem. We have the ability to solve it and the change starts with each of us. Thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you all for participating. I, as I said, the movement started. So I'm gonna follow up with the PGA and Gersh and Management 360 and the SAG After Foundation and say, all right, we did this one, let's take it to the next level. Uh, and I also wanna get beyond conversation and get to action. You know, I wanna get to the place where these conversations are great, but they ultimately lead to action that gets changed because to the video, when you see so many people's lives being disrupted and all people want to do is for the art to be seen. And yes. that's what this business is about. It is supposed to have arms open for artists, not like this, 
Every artist in this business, no matter who, what type of art you do, should be welcomed and feel like they have a seat and an opportunity for their art to be seen. Thank you all so much. Cannot wait to see where this all goes, but I am believing that change is on the way.